Hello everyone, it's Dr Paul Rose here and in this short presentation I'm going to be talking about observational methods that are suitable for animal behaviour research. This presentation covers a range of different approaches, theories and concepts that can be used to collect animal behaviour data. It's specifically focused towards the zoo but is transferable to a range of different systems, subjects and types of animal. This presentation is based on a paper that is open access and free to read in full in the journal Zoological and Botanical Gardens. This paper is written with my co-author, Dr. Lisa Riley, and is entitled Conducting Behavioural Research in the Zoo, a Guide to 10 Important Methods, Concepts and Theories. But again, whilst there is a zoo focus, it's applicable to a range of different subjects and systems. Behavioural research in zoos, on farms, in labs and of pet animals is commonplace. Behaviour allows us to infer a range of different things about the subject. Its welfare and well-being, its health and reproductive status, its physiological change. Behaviour is the observable response to a stimulus. And therefore, the methods that we use to collect behavioural data can tell us a lot about how the individual, human or non-human animal is responding to the environment around it. When starting off observational research, it's important to be repeatable and consider all aspects of your experimental design so everyone else can follow what you intend to do. By its very nature, observational research is subjective you are watching the animal and you are interpreting what it is doing. A valid and repeatable method makes this data collection technique objective. Others can do the same and you can have confidence in your results. This handy flowchart provides you with a tool that can be used to develop the best type of experimental design for the behavioural data collection that you need to perform to answer your own specific research question. The first thing to consider is have you actually identified your research question in the first place? What are you actually going to answer? And are you going to develop aims and hypotheses based on that research question? Specifically for quantitative study, hypotheses, research questions that you answer using your data are really relevant. For qualitative study, hypotheses may not be needed. But research should have an aim to show the reader where it's being directed and what its overall point is. Once you have your research question and or aim, you then need to think about what species or sample population is best to test it out upon. Don't ever pick your favourite animal. Pick the animal that you feel is best suited to allow you to collect valid data that will enable you to fulfil the aims of the research. When you've decided upon your species, think about when it's likely to be active and what it's likely to do. This is very important for when you decide to collect data and go out and see the animal and work out their behaviour patterns. When you've identified your population species, you then need to construct an ethogram, which is a list of all behaviours that the individual animal or the group of animals will perform. The ethogram is very important because the behavioural definitions within the ethogram allow others to repeat the same study and identify the same behaviours. You then need to think about whether or not the individuals in your population are recognisable. Can you recognise individuals and follow their specific behaviours? Or are you going to have to record behaviour as a group? This will influence the type of behavioural recording and sampling you use and how you gather your data. Then, when you have sampled your data and worked out when you're recording, you need to think about how much time will you actually spend observing your population. Are the behaviours that you're sampling and recording commonplace, or are they rare or infrequent events? At what time of day or season do they occur? All of these things will influence the overall experimental design that you implement. Finally, you will then be able to work out the specific behavioural methodologies that you will apply. Will this be purely observation with no experimental manipulation? Or will you experimentally manipulate the animals by using things like enrichment or environmental change? 
Will you have a repeated measures design where you repeat the same measurements on the same individuals? Or will you go around different independent populations? Will you do a structured literature search or meta-analysis to collect behavioural data from the literature and compare that to what you see in person? And finally, will you use some different or novel methods of behavioural research, such as social networks or qualitative behavioural assessment to add a different layer or different approach to your aims? So let's start off by thinking about the animal in the wild. If we're going to do a zoo-based project and interpret animal behaviour in captivity, we need to be familiar with the individual, the species, ecology, its habitat, its natural behaviour patterns and where it comes from. For example, the giraffe, a species that is focused upon in this particular paper that this video links to. What is the giraffe evolved to do? What particular habitat does it come from? How does it spend its time? In what social groups do you find it? What does it eat and how does it collect its food? And what particular fitness benefits does it derive from those behaviours? All of those questions can be answered by doing a structured literature review. So you could consider supporting your aims and objectives by reviewing the literature, by taking information from key papers that tell you about the animal and its ecology, and then working out what has been done previously, how can I add to that body of literature, and more importantly, how can I interpret the animal's behaviour in captivity by knowing exactly what it does out in the wild. This structured literature search really helps you develop aims, objectives and hypotheses because you are able to work out the precedent for any question that you will go and ask in the zoo. Let's look at what the wild will tell you when it comes to giraffe behaviour. They spend a great deal of their time feeding and foraging. The giraffe is a ruminant animal, it chews the cud. It has a trickle feeding approach, which means it's continuously selecting for food. It eats acacia trees and other thorny trees and shrubs. And this means it's specifically adapted for dealing with that type of foodstuff. The giraffe's size and shape is an adaptation for browsing on trees in the African savannah. Therefore, when we look at the giraffe in the zoo, we can consider the amount of time that the animal will be spending feeding and foraging captivity compared to what we would expect to see out in the wild. We can also look at how the giraffe's adaptations allow it to experience good welfare because it has choice and control over what it does. For example, because of the giraffe has evolved to spend a large proportion of its day feeding and foraging, it has a complex set of behaviours that it must perform to get the most amount of energy from its food. Chewing the cud, for an example, like all ruminants do. If it doesn't perform these behaviours in captivity, we could see poorer welfare. We also need to consider the size of the giraffe's habitat, its movement patterns and social grouping, as well as seasonal and climatic influences on natural behaviour patterns. So now that we've got our species and population, and we know what it does in the wild, maybe we could think about what we do in the zoo. Here's an example of an unnatural behaviour that we see in zoo housed giraffe. This is a stereotypic behaviour. It's an indicator of poor welfare. It shows that the animal is experiencing an environment that's not allowing it control and choice over its behaviour patterns. To fix, in inverted commas, this behaviour, we should look at what's missing from the giraffe's environment, which means it's not able to perform the wild type behaviours that are indicative of positive welfare that we have seen from our literature search. Swapping species for a moment. Before we consider measurement of any form of behaviour, we need to be aware of what the species does and how that behaviour can be observed. How do I identify the particular behaviours that the species performs? This is called the ethogram that I mentioned earlier. And the ethogram is explained in great detail in this paper. For flamingos, the example of the ethogram that's provided in the paper explains a range of state, 
long duration, and event, short duration behaviours, how you would identify them and describe them to others. State behaviours go into your time activity budget and event behaviours are counted or recorded as a frequency. So it's important to identify the type of behaviour, to note down the name of the behaviour so you know what you're looking for and provide a description of that behaviour so others can follow it. An ethogram must be consistent within the same study or research project, but over time, ethograms on one particular species might get bigger and bigger and bigger as we know more about them. The more we observe the flamingo or the giraffe, the more behaviours we identify, and therefore the more descriptions of behaviour we get. For small case study approaches in the zoo or other form of industry, a short ethogram of the behaviours that you have observed and collected data on on your particular animals will suffice to make your method valid and repeatable. Always include the behaviours that are linked to in the results and discussion in the ethogram in your methods and always include the ethogram in your methods because it is a tool that has been used to collect data. We have our ethogram and we understand the behaviours that we're going to record. Let's go back to some giraffes. Here are our giraffes in the zoo and we would like to do a study that looks at the differences in their behaviour pattern at different times of day. What you can see in this video are two giraffes performing two state behaviours, two long duration behaviours. One giraffe is chewing the cud. She is angled herself in a particular posture and she makes rhythmic movements of her jaws to chew the food that she regurgitates from her stomach, chews up and then re-swallows. This behaviour is indicative of good welfare in giraffes. This is a state behaviour because it takes up a large proportion of the individual's time. The other giraffe in the video is foraging from some tree branches that are just slightly out of view. We mentioned in the video previously that foraging in the wild takes up a large proportion of the animal's time. So foraging and rumination, ways in which giraffe collect nutrients from their food, are key state behaviours that they must be able to perform. And therefore, by measuring them at the individual level, we're able to work out why individuals might not be performing behaviour in the same way as we see in the wild. We can then take these behavioural data and express them as a time activity budget. Here you can see examples of fictitious data that could be put into a time activity budget. Recording is when and how you record the behavioural data and sampling is who or what you actually record. And we've got two different sampling and two different recording methods on this graph. Focal sampling is where you follow particular individuals. You know that they are identifiable so you can follow them precisely and record their behaviour individually. A scan sampling is where you have a group of animals, so you look across the group and you record your data as an average of all individuals across that period of time. Scan sampling is good for large groups, such as those flamingos, where all individuals might look very, very similar. We then have two recording techniques, continuous, where we record a continuous record of the behaviour by timing each behaviour as it occurs. And we have instantaneous recording where we record the behavioural data on a particular time interval, for example, every one minute or every two minute intervals out of an hour period. What this graph aims to show you are the differences in the accuracy of choosing these types of sampling and recording method based on the different types of behaviour. You can see that there are differences in what the time activity budget would look like compared between the continuous and the instantaneous recording, as well as between the focal and the scan sampling. We might over inflate different amounts of data on behaviour based on the sampling and recording method that we choose. Look in the literature and determine what other people have done 
around a similar research question when it comes to choosing your sampling and recording type. It's important to remember that whilst behavioural data can be very accurately recorded using pen and paper, you can also use remote technology such as trail cameras that you can position around the animal's enclosure to record the footage which you then score later on. Many freeware computer packages such as Boris are available for interpretation of behavioural data from video files. But remember, animals might not always behave in a natural manner around an unusual object in their immediate environment. You might find you need a period of habituation of the animals to the recording device so they don't interact with it and you record unnatural or unwanted behaviours because the animals are investigating the device, are interested in it and therefore do not go about their normal day-to-day -day patterns. Here you can see some Victoria Crown Pigeons that are more interested in the camera that has been set up to record them rather than performing their natural foraging activities in their enclosure. Please consider the effects of extraneous variables, those variables beyond your control, for example the position or location of the trail cam, or the presence of people around the enclosure when it comes to interpreting the behaviour of the animals. A very common question amongst behavioural researchers is how much data do I actually need to collect on my animals to work out whether or not my data are a true reflection of their behaviour patterns? And unfortunately, there is no quick and easy answer to this. This graph shows data that were collected on captive African hunting dogs for a short period of time, the blue bars, and a longer period of time, the yellow bars. What you can see is that behaviour patterns are relatively similar between the blue bars and the yellow bars. However, there are some behaviours, such as use of enrichment, that were not captured during the short period of observation. And there were some behaviours that were completely missed during the longer period of observation, i.e. the animals were never recorded as out of sight during the longer period of observations, probably because the researcher had more time to spend developing the methods, developing the project, and could follow the animals more closely. If the animal the species you are investigating has a relatively unchangeable invariant activity pattern with long state behaviours, a short period of observation is probably going to be very comparable to a long period of observation. But if the animal's activity pattern is highly varied, highly seasonal and highly temporal in how it changes, a short period of observation is going to markedly differ from a longer period of observation. As carnivores, African hunting dogs are going to be relatively invariant in their behaviours for the most part. It's only when they come together as a social group and become more active around feeding and foraging that we're likely to see behavioural differences. This might explain why there are some times during the longer period of observation where we get differences in social organisation and feeding behaviour, because that might have been missed during the shorter observation time schedule. Remember that out of sight is not a behaviour in itself, but it should be recorded so you can interpret the precise amounts of time from when the animals were observed and therefore work out the behaviour patterns from what you've actually seen. The amount of time spent out of sight is going to be influenced by your observation schedule. So do consider the activity patterns of the animal and when it's likely to be visible and you are able to follow it when designing your experimental design and working out how much time you need to spend observing animals. But unfortunately, there really is no hard and fast rule that will tell you just how much data do I need and how much time do I need to spend recording the behaviour of the animals. Check in the literature and see what others have done previously.
Your observational research project might be interested in how enrichment or other things provided to the animal in the environment influence behaviour. Here we've got a babarusa, which is a species of wild pig-like animal using its wallow in its enclosure. We might be interested in the value of this resource to the animal because it's good for animal welfare. So we might provide different wallows of different shapes and sizes and record the behaviour of the animals in each one. We might compare the behaviour of the animals without the wallow to the behaviour of the animals when they have access to the wallow so we can work out the importance of this form of enrichment to animal welfare. Go back to my giraffe right at the start of this video, the giraffe that was performing the stereotypic behaviour. We can provide enrichment to reduce or eliminate the performance of these abnormal behaviours, but we need to know the overall effect of enrichment on long-term activity patterns before we do that. So comparing baseline activity to enriched activity is a really useful way of working out what will animals do when they have more choice and control, more autonomy over their environment. Any form of enrichment study is going to require specific behavioural observations at specific times so you reduce the effect of extraneous variables time, weather, climate, human presence, for example, on the actual effect of enrichment on the animal's behaviour. So consider that when designing your enrichment study. This figure shows what can happen when enrichment is provided to the animals in the enclosure. Graph A shows you an enrichment that doesn't really work very well. The enrichment is provided where we've got the yellow cross and the activity of the animals increases. But then the enrichment declines and the animal's activity goes back to baseline levels. So the animal might be interested but then slowly decline back to baseline and it might start performance of the abnormal behaviour again. An enrichment that is more successful is shown in graph B. The animal is interested the positive behaviour increases, it then wanes, but the animal goes back to using the enrichment and we can see the heightened level of response. This enrichment keeps the animal interested over a longer period of time. To measure whether or not the enrichment is beneficial, I have provided two forms of time frame. Baseline observation in blue, environmental enrichment observation in green, and, in, and no EE environmental observa observational, it's really hard to say, and no observations of enrichment in grey, the post enrichment if you like. What you are aiming for is a baseline period for comparison and then a mixture of green and grey observations with and without enrichment so you can see this latent or long term effect of enrichment which is highlighted in graph B. If you do your baseline, then you record with enrichment, and then you record with no enrichment, you're not going to get that latent effect. You're not going to see for how long the enrichment lasts for. So a time frame of observations that looks like what I've shown you in the diagram C is best for working out the overall long-term effect of enrichment on the animal's behaviour pattern. We mentioned that the animal social grouping will also influence the behaviours that the individual performs. If your individuals are identifiable, maybe by coat markings or coat pattern, or by tags that are put onto the animal, such as leg rings on birds or ear tags in some zoo mammals, you can do a social network analysis and you can collect behavioural data on the associations or interactions of the individuals within the social group and you can do complex analysis that explains why different associations or interaction rates may be specific to particular individuals in the group. Social network analysis is really useful for helping interpret other behavioural states or events that are performed within the social group. For example, how long do individuals spend grooming? 
Is that based on the particular type of individual that they are hanging around with? Do they have particular favourites that they'll spend more time grooming with? Is foraging time increased or decreased based on the composition of that social group? Social network analysis allows the fine scale investigation of all of the social behaviours within the social group. And there are particular packages that allow you to perform that social network analysis free of charge. Social network analysis involves a very specific method and there are a range of useful papers out there that will tell you more on this experimental design. You might also be interested in doing a repeated measures or experimental setup where you are choosing to measure within particular groups to look at the effects of a control compared to an experimental condition on the animal's behaviour. For example, you might have two groups of animal and in your first observation, group A has an experimental condition and group B is under a control. And in your second observation session, you might have group A with the control and then group B has the experimental condition. Here you are able to test specifically the group effect and the individuals within those group effects on behaviour, as well as look at the ways in which the experimental condition was applied to the group to determine any influences on animal behaviour. For those doing repeated measures observations in the zoo, there are some excellent statistical packages out there, particularly in the stats program R, that will allow you to do a repeated measures ANOVA or similar and control for the repeated measures observations in your experimental setup. Here's an example of different individuals performing behaviour that is important to courtship and reproduction. These are rough, a wading bird that display as male groups to the females. And you can see the rough are those pointing downwards with the large feathers around their head. There's one that's black and grey, there's one that's chestnut and black, and there's one that has a chestnut rough. And they are directing their behaviours to the plainer, more cryptically coloured female. Here's an example of repeated measures in the same group. But also, you could do an experimental setup where maybe you introduce different females of different ages or different sizes to these male rough. So you have the repeated measures by measuring the courtship behaviour in the same animals, but also an experimental system where you are looking at the rough responses to different females. What is it about her characteristics that influence their reproductive behaviour and the amount of time that they spend as an individual on courtship display? If you are able to manipulate in the zoo what the animals are doing and when they perform that behaviour, this experimental approach is really useful for a deeper level understanding of the triggers of behaviour and why behaviour might be caused. But it's always important to remember that because your population of, of animals in the zoo is static in that you are using the same animals for your observations, you must consider these repeated measures and any potential lack of independence when it comes to your analysis. And again, there are packages available in the computer program R, for example, that will allow you to do that. This paper covers a whole range of methods, concepts and approaches suitable for the construction of a behavioural research project in the zoo. It covers some of the basics, such as time activity budgets and ethograms, to more complex methods, such as qualitative behavioural assessment for recording behavioural expression, which is useful for inferring animal welfare states, as well as behavioural diversity indices and meta-analyses to collect information and novel data from published literature. This figure puts these methods together in a suggested way of inferring animal welfare from a behavioural research project. Here we've got our abnormal behaviour that we were first introduced to of the giraffe licking and chewing on the fence in its enclosure. And our end goal is the giraffe that is feeding and foraging for a similar amount of time as we would see in the wild. We have our foundation for welfare auditing, 
by looking at the literature and determining the ecology of the animal and what it should do. We then determine any external influences of behaviour, maybe by measuring space use, maybe by looking at behavioural diversity at different times of the day, and maybe by understanding why the animal is performing particular activity patterns with others around in its social group. We then look at evolutionary and psychological factors. For example, we could define behavioural outcomes using Tinbergen's four questions, looking at the evolution, the function, the development and the causation of the behaviour. Perhaps we could look at qualitative behavioural expression to determine the reasons why personality impacts on behaviour. And therefore, we can alter or change husbandry routines based on these behavioural data. Overall, small-scale case studies in the zoo that implement observational methods can really yield relevant and valid data that can help enhance or change animal husbandry and management to allow the systems in place to keep and hold these species in captivity to be more welfare friendly and have husbandry and management regimes that are based on ecological evidence that is species and individual relevant. All of the diagrams used in this video are available in the paper with further explanation, discussion and review. Not all of the methods or approaches covered in the paper are included in this video. For example, how to score enclosure usage, how to run a qualitative behavioural assessment, how to run a behavioural diversity index, and how to apply Tinbergen's four questions to animal behaviour. However, all of these things together can be used to develop a larger scale behavioural or observational research project to answer a particular question. But don't feel you always need to be that complicated. A simple case study using one or two methods can yield really important information on species responses to captivity and tell us more about behavioural norms that are essential to our understanding of animal welfare. I hope this video has been useful and I hope the paper is useful too for any level of behavioural scientist, from those just starting out in their career to more advanced behavioural researchers that might be looking at different ways of exploring the experimental methods available. Thank you very much.